for the next talk. It's called resisting surveillance. It's not just about the metadata, and it's not. It's about the people, the people that come out. So Lily, Harry, and Jason will tell you how it is to be that people. Please, an applause. Thanks very much. I'm sure people here know about uh, surveillance. What we often hear in the mainstream press in the last few years is about Edward Snowden and metadata and uh, spying and, and computer spying and so on. Unfortunately, the three of us have seen a more intense version of, of state surveillance, I think. Uh, we've been targeted by undercover police that have come into the most in intimate spheres of our lives, and you'll hear about that. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about un undercover policing and the history of it. It's not just a new phenomenon, of course, we all know that. And some of it goes back quite a ways. You see here a book on the upper right hand. It's called What Everyone Should Know About State Repression. It was written in 1921 by Victor Serge. And after the Russian Revolution, they did a, an analysis. They found a bunch of papers of the Russian Tsar and his spying from the 1890s and so on. And undercover policing tactics go back, and it's documented at least as far as the 1890s. What we've what this book says is that the Tsar sent his private intelligence, his undercover police, into movements that opposed the Tsar with some tactics, specific tactics that we see today. For example, going into a social movement, a popular movement, and dividing and conquering or spreading lies, causing diversion, doing whatever they could to neutralize these threats to their power. And uh, that's something that concerns me a lot, that the use of undercover police has been a project in political policing not really cl criminal policing, and that's, that's what's happened. The case that we're going to talk about tonight um, kind of started for us with the outing of a British undercover cop called Mark Kennedy in 2010, 2011. The book in the middle, Undercover, is a very good prize-winning book in England uh, that came out a couple of years ago about that case. If you want to read more about the case we're going to talk about, read Undercover. Um, my personal case as, as an activist being targeted Within my broader circles, it goes back to 1989, the first year I became an activist, was with environmental groups. And in this year, 1989, it came out that the FBI had done a big project, uh, operation project called Operation Thermcon, where they sent an undercover activist into an uh, environmental groups, uh, group from Earth First. And this person had intimate sexual relations with an activist. They were selling LSD to activists to gain trust. That worked for them. And there's a book here on the bottom left if you want more info. Because I'm, I'm jumping over these themes, I'm giving you some places to read later. Spitzel is a German book with a lot of different chapters about different topics of spying. It's a very good book. On the upper left, Green is the New Red. That one does a really good synopsis of the USA um, spying on social movements starting in the 60s and so with the counterintelligence program of the FBI, COINTELPRO going up to 2000, 2006, with the efforts to smash or silent, uh, silence radical environmental movements. Uh, the bottom right is a great book called Secret Maneuvers in the Dark. It's about corporate spying. We're going to talk about that a little bit, too, because the person who targeted us well, was also involved in that. Um, yeah, so that's me, Jason. And as an activist, I've done a lot of different things, uh, protest, uh, writing, writing articles. In my small town in California, I was a vice mayor in a kind of radical activist -y town for four years. That's interesting. I, for four years, I actually was in a position to kind of be a boss of the police. So uh, that's helped me to come out and speak against police. So anyways, I'm, I'm making a film now called Spied Upon. You're going to see me filming a little bit here. And you can look at more of my website. I can give you cards later. But um, yes, I'm directing this film because I think that... I don't want to be silenced. I'm not going to be silenced about what happened to me. And so I'm in the middle of this film. Also, we're looking for financing. If you have uh, leads for financing, that'd be great. And then next up is... Um, Hiya. I wanted to show that film. Oh, you want to show the film clip? Show yeah. the film clip. Is the film clip ready? Go for it. It is. And here's a clip from the upcoming film Spied Upon. 
Mark and I were very kind of fraternal and uh, love was the word we ended up we were using how we felt about each other. It's a very strange thing feeling all your organs moved around, you know, somebody with the opposite of what you thought they were. We have the words that deal with bereavement and grief and stuff like that because that happens to everybody. This kind of thing happens to almost no one. It's a betrayal, but it's also a bereavement that you've lost this person. But at least with bereavement, you know, you had the time to return and it was real. With this, none of it was real. British energy companies have been demanding that the government crack down on climate change protesters. And Mark Kennedy is about to head into one of his most delicate undercover operations, one planned by those who have become his closest friends. This is Raptor Consor coal fired power station. We knew that to deal with the massive threat of climate change, yeah, we had to stop burning coal, and yet the government was planning a new generation at places like this. So the big fact you can see a cooling tower is putting out the steam that comes out from here, but the large one is the chimney, that's the smoke from burning coal. That's one of the largest point sources of carbon in the country. And people are going to shut down the plant, and then when the chimney is cool, get up there and climb up with enough bridge to stay there for a week, and then drop a banner that would have a rolling count of how many tons of carbon had been saved because this place wasn't in action anymore. We knew it wasn't risking anyone's energy supply to do this. You know, it's in a national grid system, so the power station can go off and on all the time. There's rising and falling demand all the time. They're used to this happening. So we knew that when that runs off, a gas fire power station somewhere else would come on instead. So they can reduce carbon emissions, but it's not threatening anyone's energy supply. There's no danger to anyone. Please were saying that this threatens hospitals, this threatens normal people. Threatens your granny, said a guy from the Association of Chief Police Officers who run the unit that Mark Kennedy was in. And they know it's in a grid system. They know as they say it, it's not true. They know they are trying to scare people. Given that this didn't threaten anybody's welfare at all, it's peculiar that they put the resources of hundreds of police officers and months of planning and an undercover officer in the shape of Mark Kennedy into the planning group right from the beginning to try and stop this when it wasn't going to hurt anyone at all. It couldn't hurt anyone at all. And so it proves that they're not actually only after threats against life and limb that the threat to corporate profit is just as serious to them. We don't know if they are pressured the police to do this, how close they were working. We do know from other cases that the corporations hire private detectives to come and do this evidence in exchange for information two ways between the police and those private eyes. And so we came together, there was, there was 114 of us uh, planning to, to come in and shut this down. And because it was, uh, it was 113 activists plus Mark Kennedy who was in the room, and we were raided by police preemptively, and all of us were arrested. It's the largest preemptive political arrest in English history, as far as we know. Okay, so thanks, Jason, for that absolutely amazing film. Um, I, I wish Merrick, who uh, was also, of course, infiltrated by um, Mark Kennedy, could be here with us. Um, unfortunately, uh, instead of getting Merrick, you got me, uh, a minor bureaucrat of cyberspace, as many of you know me, uh, with a side interest in cryptography. But actually, uh, the reason I do the work I do um, is because it's just another uh, terrain of struggle. And just like protesting in the streets is a terrain of struggle, or fighting Mark Kennedy and undercover police in general in the courts is a terrain of struggle. Um, I was organizing and protesting for many years uh, in the anti-globalization movement against the centralization of political and financial power and neoliberal capitalism, and then the climate change movement to fight uh, catastrophic climate chaos. Uh, during these uh, protests, you know, sometimes they would go wrong. 
And after they went wrong, uh, we would get together and have a meeting and be like, well, what went wrong? Uh, and at, at one of these meetings, uh, I was introduced, uh, uh, Julien Coupa, who is a, a French revolutionary, uh, introduced me to Mark Kennedy. Um, and Mark Kennedy, who I'd seen around the scene for a while, uh, you know, of course, the reason why the protests had gone wrong is because we had an undercover cop running all the logistics. Uh, <laughs> It's not our fault, we didn't know. And um, then we said, well, it'd be great if we could go and spread this conversation about the future of uh, protest movements outside of just mass mobilizations to the United States. So, you know, I went to the United States, we hung out with great people there, many people who later became involved in movements like Occupy, although it did not occur to us that the guy, uh, guy Fox Mass was gonna get big and that, uh, Sitting, in the, sitting down in a tent was gonna get really popular. Just didn't occur to us, really. Um, but at the same time, Mark Kennedy then followed me to the United States. And that is when I got put on a terrorist watch list or something more or less equivalent to that. Um, so when I came into the United States, there would be a FBI agent who would say, look, buddy, you and all your friends, you're a domestic terrorist, you're going to jail. And you know, I'd be like, hey, what's the evidence? And there was, there's no crime, there's no evidence. But you know, they would basically uh, seize my computer, hold me for uh, multiple hours, um, and it was just intolerable. So at uh, the advice of my lawyer, Ron Kuby, I left the United States, I went back to Great Britain, where I decided I was, gonna fin well, I was finishing my PhD, and when I got to Great Britain, the uh, undercover police were harassing my PhD advisor and harassing my school. And when my friends left the UK, they would be asked, you know, about, um, you know, me. And when I left the UK, the police would say, we know, you know, tell us what you know about domestic extremism. And I would say, well, the, you know, the large uh, coal burning power plants, they're ran by uh, extremists who want to destroy our civilization. And uh, they weren't very happy with that. And they would uh, for force my DNA out of me. Um, and then at some point, I was like, this is too dangerous. I'm a threat to my friends, and uh, I left the UK. And I landed up in Germany, uh, where it was revealed we were also spied upon uh, later. And I was organizing, uh, helping work with uh, organizing a protest against global climate change, the COP in Copenhagen. And uh, in the COP in Copenhagen, um, I was targeted for arrest and beaten so I couldn't see or walk. And at that moment, I decided, that I was no longer going to do uh, street protest. It was just too dangerous. I didn't know that the cause of all of this was Mark Kennedy, an undercover police officer who we thought was a friend. Um, I personally got out kind of light. Uh, Julian and nine other French people are on charges for terrorism. They spoke at Congress last year on Google. Um, other friends I have are on no-fly list and they're still on no-fly list. And I would basically just sort of say that, you know, you learn a lot being on a terrorist watch list. I think everyone should do it at least once. Hi. Oh, wow, I can't actually see any of you. Um, so, um, I've been dreading making this introduction. Um, I'm one of eight women who are bringing a case in the UK right now against the Metropolitan Police for assault and deceit and abuse of our human rights. Um, I'm in the program as Lily, and any of you who might have read about the case or some of the articles that have appeared in Germany and, and Britain about it uh, would know me as Lily. In 2003, I met this man, Mark Stone, um, at a meeting uh, for the mobilization against the G8 summit in 2005 in Scotland. He was charming and disarming and he shared my interests and he shared my passion for the political things that we were doing. Um, and he told me lots of his most intimate stories and secrets. We became very close. We spent two years living together as lovers. Um, he became very close to my parents, he spent many nights in their home, he attended my grandmother's 90th birthday party, he met my entire extended family, and 
We remained friends for many years after that, very close friends, until 2010 when I received a phone call from uh, friends in the UK who told me that this man, Mark Stone, uh, who I shared my life with, never existed. Um, and the impact of that, I think Merrick describes it very well, the, the grief and the paranoia and the sense of shame really paralyzed me for a very, very long time. Um, because of the personal nature of the case that we're bringing, uh, our anonymity has actually been protected by the court. And that privacy and anonymity was very, very dear to me. And I've spoken out before, but always under a pseudonym. I've avoided being videoed. Um, but over the last five years, um, there's been a lot more revelations about these undercover police officers. And I now know that between 1998 and 2010, at least six people that I knew and worked with and some of whom I considered friends were actually undercover police officers. And this year, I went to the Circumvention Tech Festival in Valencia. And um, after a pretty weird control by the police, we found this uh, GPS tracker stuck under my car. So, so much for my privacy. Um, and finding the GPS tracker was a bit of a wake-up call. They've basically been targeting me for the last 17 years. And that happened in part because I didn't believe that they would sink so low. I didn't believe that I was doing anything that would be interesting enough. Um, and so I think that people need to know that this happens to real people and I've started to feel like the anonymity is a bit like a gagging order and so I've decided to give it up. Um, so hi, that's me. Um, Wow, that feels weird. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the reasons why we're bringing this court case. And you can get rid of that screen now, thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the first reason is really personal. Like the knowledge about Mark not being who I thought he was was kind of like a computer virus. It, corrupted all my memories of those times and it affects all my relationships that I've had since. Um, and trying to fight back, bringing this case against the police was a way of taking back control of the story of my life. And it's been a really powerful experience because we're a group of women who've been through similar things over a 30 year period. Like the first relationships happened sometime in the early 80s and they continued right up to 2010. And so one of the things that we've learned through talking to each other is that, that these, like what happened between Mark and me was not a personal betrayal. It was a systematic abuse by an institutionally sexist organization that's been doing it for decades. And people say to us, and, and even the police have actually said as part of the court case that, well, you know, people lie in relationships all the time, which I think is a, pretty depressing way of understanding human relationships, but it's also really not what was happening here. And um, like Mark came into my life with fake ID and he'd been through a whole load of training programs. He was paid overtime for the nights that he spent with me. Um, there was a back room that was tracking his movements, that was monitoring our communications. And there was a command structure that was deciding if I was gonna have dinner with my boyfriend that night. Um, and one of the things that we found from talking to the other women is that there was a psychological and emotional manipulation going on. So I think I said Mark like told me lots of stories about how he was abandoned by his father when he was a kid and his unhappy childhood. 
Actually, his parents are still together, and, and I've read letters from other officers that were supposedly written at, um, from his mother's funeral. Um, very, very painful letters. Actually, his mother is still alive, and when all of these officers left the, um, the relationships and the missions that they were on, the, the infiltrations, they had emotional breakdowns and they disappeared, leaving notes that suggested that they might be thinking of suicide and leaving their partners absolutely distraught. And these, we now know, are tactics that they're specifically trained in, in order to manipulate us. And so another of the things that we're really interested in is getting to the truth. And I guess I kind of naively believed that if we accused the police of something, they would have to you know, defend themselves and provide us with information about what was really happening. Actually, of course, what's happened is we've had the full might of the police legal department and the uh, huge amounts of public funds being dedicated to making sure they don't have to give any information out at all. Um, and one of the things that they are now saying is that they have a supposed policy of neither confirming nor denying anything to do with undercover policing. It hasn't been a policy up until now, but now, now they're claiming it's a policy and they've actually tried to get entire cases thrown out of court because they don't want to answer the questions that they're being asked. And then in my case, they've tried to have the whole case sent to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Um, if you're involved in campaigning around surveillance or privacy or human rights in the UK, you've probably heard of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. It's basically a secret uh, court that was set up just to hear cases brought against the secret state for abuse of human rights. After the Human Rights Act came in in 2000 in the UK, they realized that actually a lot of the activities of the secret state would be um, violating people's rights and so they brought in a legal framework and a secret court to make sure that nobody had any recourse essentially um, for that. Um, pass the slide. Uh, in our case, where we're trying to get our case out of the IPT, this is actually what the judge said, that Parliament clearly intended to override fundamental human rights by bringing that law in, so we can't complain that our human rights are being violated. Um, and our claim human rights claim is sitting in the IPT still waiting for trial. So I've had to reveal a lot about my personal life and intimate details to the court and to the police in order to bring this case. And this is the kind of shit that we're getting in return. Um, nevertheless, over the last five years, a lot of information has come out and we, we're running over time already, I think, and um, I don't can't really go into it in detail, but I want to do a big shout out to some of the people who are doing the research. Um, the Undercover Research Group and State Watch uh, um, have been digging for years and they, they've got really good websites with loads of information about this. Um, the journalists Paul Lewis and Rob Evans and uh, all of their sources that have been giving, giving us this information and putting it out there. and then. All of the other groups and individuals who were affected by these operations, and particularly the ones that are involved in the COPS campaign, who are keeping the pressure on to, to keep this information coming out and to keep them having to answer questions. No, no. Um, and where we've got so far, um, actually, it, it, it's a kind of specifically weird and British thing, but you can measure how uncomfortable the British state feels about stuff that's going on by the number of investigations and inquiries and reports that are being produced about it. And on this issue of undercover cops, there's actually been, I think it's 18 different inquiries that have been started or investigations that have been started. And when all else fails, what they do is they call for a public inquiry. And, and that's what they've just done. It's starting now. It's going to take three years. Um, and Microphone. OK, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, private spying, this is also getting to be a bigger problem. Um, we talked about. Say a bit about England and Wales because you didn't let me say it. England and Wales because it's the context. 
Right, so private, private spying is a big problem, and, and also, um, in the next slide we'll talk about the, the inquiry more. So, um, it's been entering pop culture even a couple years ago. There was a Hollywood film called The East about private spying. Um, on the left, you see a slide for a group called Global Open. That's a private security from, from the UK. We know that they've been spying at least on animal rights groups. And Mark Kennedy, after Mark Kennedy stopped working for the police, um, well, I met him in 2005 when I was a G8 activist, and, and he, that's when he entered my life. He was a police officer at that time, but by the time he was outed, actually Mark Kennedy was a private spy. He said before Parliament that he worked for Global Open. He also kept his fake name and kept hanging out with his activist friends with the name Mark Stone. He went to an animal rights meeting in Italy. He was planning on coming to an animal rights meeting in late 2010 when he was outed while working for this company. And you know, technically, undercover cops are supposed to be somehow accountable if they're undercover police, actually. They're not always, we see from this lawsuit and, and so on. But as a private, uh, private security company, they're really not accountable. And private security companies are not, and Mark Kennedy was working for that company. Uh, there was also Stratfor, the global intelligence group from the USA. Their uh, emails and so were hacked by Anonymous. It was made public, so we know from their leaks that Mark Kennedy even applied to work for Stratfor. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm just going to jump onto the next slide because I'm going to give a talk on this specific topic at the, um, just back. Um, at the Concern Protest Conference in Berlin, there's a one-day conference about when companies manage protests. That's a, that's a problem, too, because companies have actually tried to totally set the agenda. They, they call it agenda setting. They get undercover cops, they ride on chat groups, and they totally try to change the focus of, of protests. So go to that conference if you want to hear more. Um, the German situation, as it relates to Mark Kennedy and undercover policing, well, it's not just Mark Kennedy that was in, in Germany we're worried about. Just after Mark was outed in 2010, late 2010, Simon, with a fake name Brenner, his real name was Broma, he was outed in Heidelberg. After activists campaigning for the last like five years, they're finally bringing this case to court, case to court if they were targeted by Broma. There's also a demonstration in Heidelberg this month. Iris Plata was an undercover cop in Hamburg. She also had intimate uh, affairs, personal relationships with activists. Um, they're campaigning on that. And the Pitchford inquiry, what we heard about the, the inquiry in the UK that's coming up, now it says it includes only England and Wales. It excludes Scotland, which means like all of us hung out with, with Mark Kennedy in Scotland and they're excluding that because of the G8 protest, 2005. And uh, so a couple of us are campaigning that we, need, we want to know what Mark Kennedy was doing in Germany. And in the last two weeks, uh, members of parliament, Hans Christian Strobler and Andre Hunko have made statements. There have been articles, if you Google their names, and Mark Kennedy, blah, blah, then you will see that they are demanding that the Mark Kennedy case in Germany be a part of this British inquiry because they say the case is not solved in Germany. Mark Kennedy committed three crimes here, including an arson in Berlin. And he gave a fake name, his fake name, Mark Stone, to a judge. That's, that's all illegal. That has to be clarified. Um, myself and, and others, we are applying for what they call in England core participant status. This means when they, Pitchford does this inquiry, they've actually said that people targeted by undercover cops um, are allowed to sit there and, and be a part of the inquiry. So I'm applying to be there. I think these other folks on stage with me are applying because we want to direct this inquiry. We had enough, we've had enough of the cops covering up. They get paid to cover up. They lie. I've interviewed for my film members of parliament in England who said the police have been dishonest to them. And we want to get to the bottom of it. And if we're, we're trying to get court participant status so we can, we can fight to make sure the truth comes out. Um, on the last topic, I've met with uh, a German member of parliament from the, the um, in and Ausschuss, the Interior Committee, who says that actually for private undercover cops, they're not specially regulated. So if, like I said, an a undercover cop should buy, uh, buy by some laws, but the private undercovers can come here and do whatever they want. It's still, it's totally unregulated in Germany. Move on to Harry. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to speak about the uh, wonderful logic of uh, the discovery of dissidents, domestic extremists, and terrorists uh, using uh, social network infiltration, which is what Mark Kennedy was a specialist at. So his job was to go to a meeting of people who maybe wanted to protest, 
didn't seem to really care about exactly what, uh, but m his job was to map the social network and to discover the top influencer. And I just want to quickly say this is uh, a FBI analysis ran by a piece of relatively bad graphical software called Tartan, which was used by Stratfor against Occupy Oakland. And uh, solidarity with Jeremy Hammond. We would not have this had Stratfor not been hacked. Um, And, 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 and last little thing, like, like, you know, the undercover thing is, 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 is huge. And so, you know, power the people, but fuck the secret police, particularly Sabu. Like, that shit, kill that guy, metaphorically, not, not literally. Um, so what they're doing is that they are trying to discover who knows who. And the problem with this is that by that logic, you know, I'm in rooms with lots of people. I, I actually told my story about being on a terrorist watch list first to the uh, OECD in Paris on their big data and privacy meeting. And the US representative got me lunch, which was very nice of him. And he apologized because I'm obviously, you know, I don't consider myself a terrorist. Uh, I uh, have not been charged with a crime. I, I don't actually think I've committed a crime. Um, but you know, nonetheless, by virtue of uh, my political beliefs, I've been somehow uh, put on this watch list, and then people I know then would get put on, particularly if they met Mark Kennedy or hung out with him a bit. And uh, essentially, you know, by that logic, everyone I know is a potential terrorist, and everyone in this room is therefore a potential terrorist. And that, obviously, as a guy who has a PhD in machine learning, that's a whole lot of false positives, right? So it's not a good, like, whatever the police are trying to do with undercover cops like Mark Kennedy, it's not going to really get you any good data. Okay, next slide. So, um, so you know, when you realize, oh, I'm on this list, what should I do? Um, well, one thing you should do, and laws are different, data protection in Europe, in the US you have uh, Freedom of Information Act, you should file a FOIA, you should get a really good lawyer. Uh, I love Ron Kuby, he's a great lawyer, he's the lawyer uh, the dude asked for in The Big Lebowski, he's a totally down guy, and he did a FOIA request, and then a year later, they're like, yeah, we got 7,624 pages on you, I was like, oh man, I carried a burner laptop with me. How did you get my email? I don't know, what is, what's all in that 6, uh, 7,624 pages? So, you know, they say, oh, it's going to take us a while to redact this, da 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 da. And then uh, you get uh, some of the stuff, and then you get uh, great files like this one where everything is redacted but the dates. But you realize uh, there's an investigation going on called uh, Harry Halpin et al. Uh, Ed Ali and others. Uh, my lawyer says, you know, you want to be an Et Al, right? So that, that's something was going on. We don't know precisely what. Still don't know to this day. And uh, give me a, the next one. And then you also like learn a lot about like how the FBI work by looking at your files. So. Uh, you learn that the FBI are talking to a lot of people about you. Uh, some people are saying things that you uh, don't know because of various exclusions, like B6 and B7C. Um, and one thing that definitely happened when uh, Mark Kinney provoked a lot of, various undercover police provoked a lot of FBI attention, particularly in New York City, where the grand jury was apparently running out of, uh, is that a lot of people freak out. Because like, oh man, like, you know, I, I, you told me you were harassed at the airport and, you know, oh, you know, like somehow you know some police and this is terrible. So you say, oh, maybe, maybe you're an undercover cop and oh, you just you, really isolating people uh, who are being uh, under threat is, is really dangerous. Um, and actually, you know, at least with undercover police like Mark Candy, I can like understand why they try to destroy social movements? Because they're paid to do it. Uh, when you see people who are part of social movements destroy their own social movements by snitch jacketing, going totally paranoid, calling people police, all this sort of stuff, happened a lot in New York, I'm not gonna name any names, but you are doing the job of the police and not even being paid for it. So fuck those people. However, you also learn that a lot of people are great people. Um, you know, people make mistakes, I've made mistakes, trying to figure out what was going on, who is the source of this data, what evidence do the police have me, on me. But you also see a lot of people that really uh, were put under severe pressure by the FBI and resist, and a lot of these people, or I would assume, ordinary people, family, friends, employers, and I would just like to big thank you to all the people who have not folded under tremendous pressure from the secret police.
And then you're just like, oh man, like, if, you know, Mark Kennedy, he said, oh, I, you know, I was mentally unstable. They didn't give me a psychoanalyst. Uh, I just kind of made stuff up because, you know, it was a great job. And you're like, wow, well, that's wrong. You just really screwed with my life for many, many years. And um, I still get hassled at the UK border and going into Schengen. And wouldn't it be great to, to, to get off this list or at least find out why I'm on? And, uh, you know, you have a UN Human Rights Act, which basically says you shouldn't do this unless there's a real reason and some due process, some things that come from the Magna Carta. We've been fighting it for like a thousand years. And you also have, particularly in Europe, you have personal data where personally it must be processed fairly and you have the right to have it rectified if it's wrong. However, when you ask if I'm known undercover police and put on a watch list how to get it rectified, you get something more or less like this. You get a national security exemption. So like, well, why do we release people like Mark Kennedy? Well, we release people like Mark Kennedy and these undercover cops into the world because there is terrorist everywhere. So all this, you know, due process and enlightenment is thrown out the window instantly and we enter what a Gauman calls a state of ex uh, <laughs> exception where the application of law is completely arbitrary and anyone can be labeled a terrorist at any time. You just have to look at how the European Council defines terrorism to unduly constrain public authorities or an international organization, which I guess could be any multinational company, to perform or to refrain from performing any action. So that means like, you know, Freiheits.angst or maybe, I don't know, boycotting McDonald's, that could all be terrorism. So it's pretty vague at best. So now it's... It's working? So the other reason why we brought the case was to try and make sure it didn't happen again. Um, in the beginning, what it shouldn't happen again meant to me was that no other women should be abused in the way that we were. Um, but it's got a lot broader than that over time. Um, and I think now the thing that... You can pass this. Um, so now the thing that we, that, that I really feel is important, I mean, I've said I, um, oh, I'm lost, sorry. So I want my files, I want to know, I want them to fill in the gaps for all of those things that I don't know what was happening in my life, but they're not giving us that information and they, the reasons why and these national security exemptions, they're all about saying that this kind of undercover policing is somehow legitimate. Um, and we have examples from history, and, and I was in Berlin before I came here, and um, that's somewhere where they, they actually decided that what happened, what the undercover police were doing was not legitimate, and, um, and everybody was given access to their files. And I would really like to see that change of attitude happening. There is no circumstances, there is nothing that people could be doing that I think justifies this kind of political policing. and. Um, and then the other thing that I think is now really important is I want Reaper and the IPT gone. And I think, um, yeah, basically, uh, I think it's important to say here because lots of people are involved in campaigning around, um, around issues that can touch on that. And basically, I would just like to say, kick those bastards every time you get the chance. Smash Reaper, smash the IPT, like they're, they're, they're fucked up and we want them gone. Um, And um, yeah, do you want to do the rest? Or? <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, and uh, another thing I just want to bring up is the, uh, the issue of uh, m what's called pervasive surveillance or targeted surveillance, and these are often viewed as a dichotomy. So you sort of say, so I work with like lots of engineers at like Microsoft and Google and these places, and they're really nice people for the most part. They're a little angry at mass surveillance, they feel violated, and it's kind of freaky thinking, oh, uh, NSA is spying on everyone on the planet. And so they're like, oh, we have to stop pervasive surveillance. That pervasive surveillance is a threat. But there's this like myth that basically says, well, you know, maybe the police might need a back door because there's like a legitimate target, and you know, there's certain people that we should target, uh, that guy right there, for example. And um, it's basically targeted surveillance. The point of mass surveillance is targeted surveillance. And targeted surveillance, for the most part, in my experience at least, uh, targets people who are activists 
who are trying to change the world for a better place. And under the incredibly vague way that terrorism cases and social network analysis and all stuff is run and big data, God help us when they start doing real stats, uh, you know, targeted analysis could target anyone in this room and anyone on the planet at any time. So you have to be 100% against targeted surveillance. And you need an international response. One of the reasons to do focus on Indian crypto and anonymity systems is because ultimately changing these laws is going to be really hard. It may not ever happen. But at the same point, we have to do something. And I really feel like the way that hackers can help social movements by building systems they can do that can prevent not only pervasive surveillance, but also prevent targeted surveillance. Because ultimately, any, you know, I believe everything I believed before I met Mark Kennedy. You know, I believe it even, even more. You know, capitalism is totally ending. It's going to be a dead social order in the next few decades. Climate change is a global threat to humanity. And, you know, the financial system's screwed. And it's like if young people can't go into the streets without being victims of targeted surveillance and undercover police, we're never going to change and get the world we want. And um, I just, is this on? Yeah. And I think it's really important to say that, I mean, obviously my story is pretty horrible and the stuff that we're talking about is pretty horrible. Um, and I don't want to send people out of here traumatized and scared and not wanting to to take action and I think it's important that people know that this stuff is happening but I think it's also important to say that this stuff happened to us because we were doing something right um, and yeah like don't don't stop don't be scared by what we're saying be aware but yeah. Um. Yeah, and if you are Germ uh, German or in Germany, then there are things you can do here. Uh, we didn't talk about this problem so much at the European Union level, but actually there have been questions at the European Union, like um, how can all of these things happen, these human rights violations, and these kind of things have to be addressed at the European Union. You can, you can uh, make pressure there, you can make pressure in the, in the German parliament, you can take to the streets, you can help support my film, or if you're in Germany, you can help to get rid of Germany's political police, the Verfassungsschutz. <laughs> when I asked the, the German police, the BKA LK, for my file about Mark Kennedy, they gave me nothing. But when I asked the Verfassungsschutz, I had a list of 31 things that had been uh, on my file, like Jason gave a political protest uh, a, a lecture, a political lecture about the G8, or whatever. All this political stuff, none of it was illegal. 31 things in my Verfassungsschutz file, none of which were illegal at all. They were all about public things. So you can uh, support these folks. I'm going to give a talk also next, next month in Berlin. And um, we are active. We weren't intimidated. And we hope that you will stand with us and fight and help us find justice. Thank you very much. Um, last little note, I, I forgot about this, but if any of you have been targeted by undercover police, I mean, Mark Kennedy would be great, but there's many, many others. Um, I think you should probably uh, either give those documents to a lawyer if uh, maybe you can give them my lawyers, man, to give you their info, or you could leak those documents somehow. And that I, I just want to say this to the police officers watching the video: we have lots of documents. So really, all this lying—you're not going to win. So, is that on? Can you hear me? Yeah. So as you can see now, we have time, a lot of time for questions. Uh, so we start, you see two microphones, one is there, one is here. So if you want, queue up. And we start with you in the blue shirt. A question. Yes, thanks for your talk. It really great to see that some people fight back. Um, if everyone here have the idea or interest to get also files from the BKA or the Verfassungsschutz, there's tomorrow a workshop how to get your file from the Geheimdienst 
at the BR in the dome at 12 o'clock. Yeah, at the BR. Join the workshop. Do you want, huh? So next question. Thank you very much for a really excellent talk. And I think I say on behalf of probably everyone here, um, incredible condolences and solidarity to you guys and everyone else who's been targeted by these undercovers. I think one of the most interesting things which has come out of these revelations, um, which was, I guess, maybe not really intended at all, it seems to me from having been involved in various activist circles for the past couple of years, certainly I got involved just as the Mark Kennedy thing was really, was really blowing up. And it seems like we're really being uh, afflicted by this incredible culture now of paranoia. And so I hear things like, um, you know, as soon as anyone sticks their head above the pulpit, either because they're very experienced or because they're very um, um, knowledgeable or just because they're, they're, they're very good at what they do and very effective, um, or as soon as there's an interpersonal disagreement with, 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 with someone, the accusations start flying. Oh, you see that guy with the, um, with, with the camera? He's definitely an, un an undercover. Why is he filming? Uh, for the rest of you, I'm pointing at one of the CCC camera operators. Um, or, oh, do you know, uh, I hear it was on, on CNN the other day, it was on BBC, they have really small drones that are the size of your fingernails, and they can fly anywhere and land anywhere, even in a hurricane, and, f and follow you around. This is what the Mark Kennedy thing was all about, of of course, I have heard this. Um, so I guess my question is, where do we go from here? Like, have you um, experienced this kind of like pa paranoia, really almost unreasonable paranoia yourselves? If so, how did you respond? And how do you think we in the activist community can respond to this kind of environment, which has been totally inadvertently arisen? Thank you. Okay, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, in my case, I think I wasn't paranoid enough. Um, so, I, but I also, in some ways, I'm kind of glad that I wasn't paranoid enough. And I, I spoke to another woman who was friends with Mark after he, after he was found out. And one of the things she said was, well, um, I guess I'm not as good at judging people as I thought, but who wants to go around judging people all the time? And I think the, the thing is that you, you do have to be careful, um, but you also have to kind of be serious about it. Actually, long before Mark Kennedy was, undercovered, uh, was uncovered, the uh, activist movements lived with this culture of paranoia, and a lot of the time we do paranoid stuff that is pointless and damaging, and, and I mean, the stuff that Harry was talking about from New York, and. And then we don't actually, we're not sensible about it. We don't do the sensible stuff. So what I would say is, if you think somebody's an undercover cop, don't whisper about it. You know, don't, don't spread rumors. Don't try and trash that person personally. Actually, you know, try and find out. You know, the, 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 the undercover cops that have been uncovered um, are people that people have suspected and they've looked, they've looked for birth certificates, they, you know, they've, they've actually seriously tried to find out. And I think it's important to say that actually the people who turned out to be undercover cops were not the people you didn't like so much. You know, the, the weirdo in the corner who doesn't have any friends and everyone goes, oh, I think that guy's probably a cop because he makes me feel uncomfortable. They were our closest friends. I've done actions in affinity groups where there were only two of us and one of the members of that affinity group was an undercover cop. And when people actually started to suspect and started to investigate, you were investigating your close friends and it was something that was very painful to do and people took very, very seriously. It wasn't something that you did as a kind of gossipy, rumory thing that... And I, th and I think that's really important. Like, don't... Be sensitive, we can also get it wrong. Don't say you think someone's a cop unless you know, don't. And, and yeah, like try to, 
Also, try to be careful about what really, really, really has to be kept secret and what actually people can be included in, even if maybe that means undercover cops are involved, because otherwise we end up shutting ourselves down and, and becoming more and more paranoid and, more and, and less and less effective. Um, um, I don't know if anyone yeah. else... A good level of, of transparency in, in your group can help a long ways. And in some of the books that I mentioned, there's advice. For example, there's a great book in the U, from the USA called War at Home, uh, Covert S Surveillance Against U.S. American Activists and What We Can Do About It. That book has great advice. Um, if you're paranoid, you're in a certain group and you, you can't deal with it, well, there's a million ways that you can be active. You can pass out flyers, you can cook food, you can do a million things. And, um, the thing that I think is sad on occasion is when someone is uh, paranoid and they step out and they end their activism. What we need is a way to think about how we can have a lifelong way of being active and continuing to be active and incorporating that activism in into our everyday life and to keep on going. All right, the next question, please. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I am so angry when I hear what happened to you. I'm amazed at how dignified you are in facing this. Um, I was in uh, the UK uh, for a lot of the time when the Mark Kennedy case came up and then when you uh, started bringing your case. And, you know, so there were, there were judges talking about, disgusting judges talking about this like it was some James Bond fantasy, uh, police chiefs talking about how lying is a part of every relationship. And, uh, you know, they brought up some old cases where, where having sex with activists was clearly seen as a perk of the job. And, you know, while, while wishing every personal unhappiness that can be, you know, won from such attitudes, I, I, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about uh, the case you're bringing with institutional sexism and how that's going and, and how you're arguing that. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, I mean, the, the issue with, with institutional sexism is one, one of the things that is significant about the, the, the decades of undercover police that have been inside the political movements in the UK is that while there have been cases of relationships, uh, of, of sexual encounters with men, um, the, these kind of long-term relationships where I mean, I think effectively we were used as, as part of their cover story. Um, only really happened to women, and I think, I mean, I dread to think what the, the cafeteria culture must have been like within those undercover units. Like, um, that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night. And um, I think getting, I mean, getting that message across, I don't really know how to answer the question. Like, it's something that we just have to keep saying. One of the problems with the institutional sexism of the Metropolitan Police is that it's embedded in the institutional sexism of the British legal system and within the generalized sexism in our society. And so um, it's a kind of, it's a, something we have to fight on a lot of different levels. But um, what we've been doing is by bringing these cases together and, and showing that, you know, this is not... They, they tried to say in the beginning that it was just one, like, lunatic and that Mark Kennedy had done this, but that, that nobody else did. And then some other cases came up and they kind of said, yeah, well, you know, there's this, this unit that was the special demonstration squad and they were totally out of control and we shut them down and we brought in the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act and everything is now fine. Um, and... And then more cases have come up since the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. And I think it's just a case of showing that, that this is systematic. This is something that they've been doing. This is part of their operational tactics. And um, yeah, we need more whistleblowers for sure. Um, and that would be really great. So for those undercover cops who are watching the video or sitting in the room, like... We have... <laughs> Ah, sorry.
We have time for another question, please. So in New York City, for about a decade, uh, the NYPD, uh, New York Police Department Intelligence uh, Division was, uh, the demographics unit was uh, surveilling Muslims en masse. Uh, so there was a lawsuit about this two years ago, and um, one of the judge's arguments in defense of this was that the actual damage happened was through the revelations of the surveillance itself, and not the surveillance itself. So I'm curious, um, you know, as you talk exposing uh, different policing tactics, uh, what is your response to um, what the damages are and why surveillance in itself is the damage. So, I mean, surveillance creates uh, a culture of fear and paranoia, and you have a large-scale complex society like ours that is in desperate need of social change um, by attempting to destroy uh, the creativity and the power of people to self-organize, you are actually uh, committing large-scale uh, social suicide to your entire uh, society. That's incredibly damaging. You will never change a society by creating a police state, even a one which is supposedly justified by terrorism. So one of the arguments around why shouldn't you know, we release more into in crypto, uh, one of the arguments is, well, well, how do we find the terrorists? Well, you know, this in crypto and other technologies, which effectively uh, make targeted and mass surveillance harder, is a public good in the same way that roads, for example, are public goods, right? So um, effectively, you know, terrorists drive on roads. They have, they go on airplanes. Do we ban airplanes and stop building roads and destroy the ones we have? No, we don't make them illegal, you know. The same with uh, crypto. And the, the culture of surveillance is trying to hold back uh, innovation in building anonymizing systems, in building privacy enhancing technologies, is really uh, possibly going to destroy one of the, the few things that actually will help defend our rights when our uh, legal structure is, is pretty clear with the, with the cases that. Uh, uh, Kate's been in, and you know I'm in, and Jason, and whatnot. Is that you know th the legal infrastructure needs the technological uh, guarantees because the legal structure is being undermined completely by this total nonsense of surveillance. Okay, I checked with my supervisor, and he said we have another question. The last one, please. It, it's not really a question. It's just a comment. Um, all of these, uh, the police surveillance pe surveilling people uh, and activists uh, already happened in South America in the, in the years of the Desaparecidos. And uh, uh, you did a, a great work because the outcome of that uh, experience was that many of the persons that were um, infiltrated in the, um, in the activism, after some years became uh, some sort of political center and uh, they were actually the people that were got elected and get out in the hierarchy, even of the states. So uh, your was a big. Um, you, you did uh, very well because uh, you uh, you actually uh, uh, they they didn't have the opportunity to become more important and uh, have more uh, um, influence in the society. That was. I just make one, one little comment which is that the, the, the data protection regulations, a lot of these regulations were set into place after World War II in order to prevent the rise of a massive secret police apparatus because people knew how bad that had gone, right? By undermining those uh, laws and, of course, holding back technological progress, uh, we made it easier for these sorts of uh, large-scale uh, surveillance to come back. But the fact of the matter is I'm pretty lucky. I'm like, you know, this white dude, I work at MIT, you know, I'm not dead. I'm not in Guantanamo, right, you know. And the fact of the matter is many people who are put on these lists, uh, you know, Dirty War, for example, by Jeremy Scanhill does, does excellent analysis. These people, if they're in Pakistan, if they're in Iraq, if they're in Africa, if they're in many countries, they are killed. Right, so this is a big difference, but at the same point, that means we have to fight really hard to show it can be defeated, because a lot of these killings are coming from European and American governments and Western governments. That's why you really have to fight really hard as someone who lives in these countries as well for also preventing this from happening all over the globe. All right, uh, a big thank you for this really interesting talk. Uh, loud applause.
for Kate, Harry and Jason. Thank you so much. That's for you guys. Really good job.